you, and good morning, or rather afternoon for those of you on the East Coast. I'm Samantha Scotty, Research Analyst with the NCSL Health Program. Health Program. On behalf of the National Conference of State Legislatures, I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Coordinating Healthcare in Rural America, a Profile of State Models. Before we get started with today's panel, I would like to remind participants that NCSL is a bipartisan membership organization of state legislatures. NCSL advocates for the interest of states and provides policymakers the opportunity to exchange ideas. This webinar is a platform for information exchange. We encourage a robust Q&A at the conclusion of the presentation and remind listeners that opinions expressed on today's webinar do not represent NCSL policy positions. Also, today's webinar will be available on the NCSL website as a video archive. NCSL staff has increasingly heard from policymakers investigating innovative ways to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of healthcare services through care coordination, particularly in rural areas to help address the disparities in access to care and health status faced by rural residents. Our speakers today will share information on their unique state models of care coordination in rural America. I have the privilege today of introducing our three panelists. We are very fortunate to have Jennifer Dunn as our first speaker. Jennifer is the Director of Programs for the Colorado Rural Health Center, which she has been with since 2008. She has worked in healthcare and the healthcare field for over 15 years and Jennifer has previous experience in training, product line development, grant writing, and grant management, and health insurance programs for underserved children and families. Next, we will hear from Carolyn Miller. Carolyn is the Associate Director of Special Projects and Quality Improvement for Alabama Medicaid. She is a licensed clinical social, social worker with over 25 years of experience in medical, social work, behavioral health, and public health. Finally, we will have a presentation from Lisa Leidendorf. Lisa has served as the founder and director of the Northeast Oregon Network from its inception in 2004 to the present. She has a 20-year history of clinical practice as a licensed clinical social worker. Before I turn the floor over to Ms. Dunn, I'd like to remind the audience that the webinar today will conclude with a question and answer section. Please note that you will not be identified when you ask a question, nor can other participants see what you have typed. You may ask a question at any point during the webinar. Simply click on the Q&A button located on the bottom left side of your screen and type in your question. Please make sure you ask your question to all panelists. And remember, that the questions will remain anonymous. We've left plenty of time for Q&A, so we encourage you to ask questions. We will also post today's PowerPoint presentation on the NCSL website with an audio archive of the webinar, and this archive will be ready in five to 10 business days. Now I would like to turn the floor over to Jennifer. Great, thanks so much, Samantha, and um, thanks to you and NCSL for this opportunity to present. Um, as Samantha mentioned, I am with the Colorado Rural Health Center, which is Colorado's state office of rural health. And we represent a broad mix of people, programs, and organizations interested in rural health care issues. Um, we are a 501c3 organization, and we are one of three state offices of rural health in the nation that is organized as a not-for-profit organization. So our mission is to enhance health care services in the state by providing information, education, linkages, tools, and energy towards addressing rural health care issues. So today I wanted to um, just kind of touch on some background about um, our state and provide some context and then speak to some of the statewide initiatives and provide some examples from some of the work that we've done with um, rural facilities in this area. So um, as the State Office of Rural Health, we work with rural facilities and communities statewide, and this is kind of a visual um, of that. Um, we work with a variety of facilities, and included in that are um, the state's 29 critical access hospitals, as well as the 52 rural health clinics throughout the state. 
So 73% of Colorado's 64 counties are rural, which equates to over three quarters of the state's land mass, just to give you some perspective on our state. So in thinking about this presentation, care coordination, um, those aspects of it, care coordination is really a key component throughout the emerging healthcare models and national topic areas, things such as the triple aim, population health, and initiatives focusing on reducing readmissions. And then um, the triple aim plays a big role in much of the work that's happening across our state as well as in rural areas with the focus on improving patient experience, improving population health, and reducing costs as well. So um, I wanted to provide a little bit of background and context of some of the unique characteristics and needs of rural Colorado that can impact a lot of this work. And at CRHC, we've compiled a database of county-level indicators and statistics to provide information and demonstrate the unique needs of rural Colorado for a, var a variety of demographic and um, health-related measures. So for example, in rural Colorado, the population like we're looking at those sense of are only a little bit higher than in urban areas, um, with a population segment over 65 years old projected to grow the most in rural areas. In rural areas between now and 2018. Um, similar to other states as well, we face workforce shortages. So, for example, six counties in Colorado do not have a uh, licensed dentist or dental hygienist, and we have about a dozen counties that do not have a licensed psychologist or clinical social worker. So, um, these limitations and limited access to specialists can definitely um, impact this work and equate to challenges with things such as care coordination as well. Additionally, in looking at some of the other factors, um, rural areas experience higher rates of poverty than um, urban areas well, um, do, as well as challenges with um, lack of transportation, which can impact patients' ability to get to appointments, especially when we're thinking about some of the long distances and time involved in that um, in rural areas, too. So HIT, Health Information Technology, has really emerged over the past few years um, as an important player in this. And many of Colorado's rural health providers use um, Health Information Technology, or HIT. However, barriers in the adoption and use of um, health IT can include resource limitations when purchasing new or upgrading existing systems, um, inadequate broadband and internet access, and staffing shortages that impact the availability for training, implementation, and lack of HIT personnel to effectively implement and sustain um, health IT efforts. But um, despite these limited resources, rural clinics and hospitals are working to adopt and make meaningful use of electronic health records and really utilize them to improve clinical care coordination, quality, and patient satisfaction. So really, kind of all of these factors come together to speak to the limited resources and challenges rural facilities face and their need to maximize resources and efficiencies as they continue to provide high quality care to their community. So in Colorado, um, there's a lot of activity focused on care coordination, care transitions, and reducing readmissions um, throughout the state. Um, so for example, through Colorado Medicaid, um, the Accountable Care Collaborative has been formed with an emphasis on promoting a medical home approach, including care coordination as a key element to improve care for Medicaid patients. So through this model, primary care providers serve as medical homes for their Medicaid ACC members and work with regional care collaborative organizations throughout the state to help manage and coordinate care and connect and connect um, members with services. Um, and so within this model, currently there are a little over two-thirds of our federally certified rural health clinics participating right now, and that number continues to grow. There are also other statewide initiatives and projects as well that have been focusing on care coordination through work such as um, patient-centered medical home and other statewide efforts that are looking to integrate behavioral and physical health. Um, and these are all areas where care coordination will continue to be critical. Um, and there are also statewide initiatives um, that we are a part of as well, kind of looking at best practices from all of these um, efforts um, going on across the state um, and facilitating some of that peer learning too. 
And then through our office's um, program, ICARE, which stands for Improving Communication and Readmissions, we have been incorporating these elements from a rural vantage point um, as rural facilities continue to make advancements in this area. So um, in turning to iCare, I wanted to provide a few examples that I thought would be pertinent um, to this presentation today that we've seen through um, our work with rural facilities in that program. So with focus on reducing avoidable readmissions, improving communication and in transitions of care, and improving clinical processes that contribute to both of these, especially for chronic disease populations, um, care coordination is an element that runs through all of these. So as some background, we began eye care in 2010 with Colorado's critical access hospitals. And then th about three years ago, we were able to expand the program to rural health clinics, which has provided a great opportunity for participants to look at cross-facility communication and coordination efforts for things such as discharge planning and follow-up care. So we started the program with nine hospitals in 2010, and now we have over 20 hospitals and over 20 clinics that are currently participating in the program, examining process improvements to increase efficiencies, maximize resources, and reduce duplication, all for the betterment of patient care. So through this program, we in our office provide a basic framework, which includes goal selection, data submission, project webinars, use for peer learning, education, and we also provide technical assistance and one-on-one -on -one support. Um, through this program, within that framework, we also, however, allow for flexibility so that the projects can meet the differing needs um, since each community is very different. Additionally, we emphasize a team approach to this work, encouraging participants to come together as a hospital and clinic team to really examine some of those common core elements that cross settings um, and um, facilitate some of those communication efforts. And then um, our program also taps into the tenets of the triple aim as we leverage available data around patient satisfaction and process improvement. Um, we utilize our um, HARC database that I mentioned earlier, um, which really brings the population health focus, and then also work on assistance with maximizing processes and efficiencies to reduce costs. I'm going to skip this slide and I'll come back to it here. Um, so um, throughout the project, facilities examine data to trend outcomes um, and utilize this data to identify opportunities to really drive their quality improvement efforts. Um, so some of the data includes readmission measures as well as um, diabetes and hypertension measures that are relevant to the work that um, facilities are, are working on. And then in selecting measures for this project, we worked to get input input from participants on measures that would um, not only be meaningful to them um, and demonstrate impact in their settings, but would also tie in and align with other efforts as well um, in an effort to decrease duplication and burden on participating facilities with all of um, the data needs um, that are out there. So as I mentioned, I wanted to provide um, a few examples um, pertinent to this discussion, um, examples and success stories um, highlighting some of the coordination efforts occurring um, that we've experienced. Um, so, um, so one example I wanted to, to point out is some of the work done in discharge planning and follow-up appointment scheduling. So one of the um, participating teams that we work with, um, one of the communities, has created a comprehensive discharge packet for their patients. Um, the packet is sent home with the patients at the time of their discharge to address and prevent um, a variety of issues and really provides a complete administration schedule. Uh, the packet has received um, overwhelming positive support and feedback and has really helped to bridge a gap with communication between the hospital and clinic as well as enhance the continuity of care for the patient and the provider as well. And then as I mentioned, um, some of the clinics are focusing on some of their um, diabetes um, populations and so um, in another community that we're working with, the um, clinic and hospital have started working with other two clinics in their area to provide diabetic as well as other chronic disease education to the community um, in align with the needs that they've seen through their data. So the three area clinics have all have educators and work together to ensure the entire community has access to classes and resources. 
resources. And then they have also begun working with local schools to initiate an exercise program. So really trying to coordinate um, and disseminate that information and connect patients with the resources that are out there. And just a final third example I would say is um, in another one of our communities on the Eastern Plains, um, the, the hospital and clinic team have a provider champion that has really worked with them to evaluate patients' outcomes through the data that they've been collecting um, and analyzing key factors in, that out, in those outcomes. And through that, they've identified and in talking with their patients kind of a lack of access and awareness of some of the available resources that um, were out there in their community for diabetic patients, um, including um, tools and information and classes and workshops. And so they've worked to um, not only provide links to that information on their website, um, but also then to help coordinate some of that um, awareness and um, linking those patients to those resources for some of their um, self-management training and needs to that. So those are just a few of the examples that I wanted to share. And then just kind of in terms of our next steps with eye care, we are incorporating aspects from different care settings throughout the community as we continue to expand this program, realizing that they all play a role in patient care and the coordination and communication between entities is really critical. And then additionally, we're working to support facilities with some of the HIT challenges that I spoke to earlier um, that they're encountering and providing connection to resources and facilitating discussions to try to work through some of those issues to help them really optimize the, the technology that they have. So I think that's um, all I have. So thank you again for this opportunity. And I will turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you, Jennifer. That was very informative. Remember, you may ask questions at any point during this webinar. Simply click on the Q&A button located on the right side of your screen and type in your question. Next, we will have a presentation from Carolyn Miller. Go ahead, Ms. Miller. Thank you, and thank you for this opportunity to allow me to share our experiences in Alabama with the health homes. The health home program, as many of you may know, uh, was started with the Affordable Care Act to allow Medicaid programs to have a state plan amendment to provide intense care coordination with people with chronic conditions as well as behavioral health conditions so that you are integrating the medical and health care for that patient and helping them to manage their chronic conditions through transitional care, patient education, and care coordination. We developed the patient care networks in 2011 in Alabama, and it covered four piloted areas of our state. It, it encompassed 21 counties out of 67, most of which were rural. We had a couple of um, two or three metropolitan areas. But like Colorado, most of our areas of Alabama are considered rural counties. Um, I think it's actually greater than 75 percent. In 2012, we were approved through a state plan amendment for our patient care networks to go forward as health homes. And then uh, starting April 1st of this year, we went statewide with our health home program. And met, the primary reason for that was because of the great success we had with our patient care networks in care coordination and helping those patients with those chronic conditions. To qualify for services for our health homes in Alabama, and across the country for that matter, you had to have two chronic conditions, be diagnosed with one chronic condition and be at risk for another, or be diagnosed with a behavioral health condition or substance abuse. In our state, we not only decided to work with all of the chronic conditions that CMS asked, CMS asked for, but we also added several chronic conditions, as you can see listed here. Um, obesity is one, is a, a very important one for the state of Alabama. We always tend to be 49th or 50th. Uh, maybe it's because of all the bad foods we eat here in the South, but that's always been a huge concern for our state. And we have really been able to focus on that with many of our patients and recipients in Medicaid. We added hepatitis C beginning in April 1st. Um, 
to work with that population as well. Nope. Go back one. So what services do we provide with our health home program across the state? Um, we have listed here three of our primary services that we have, care coordination, transitional care, and medication management. In care coordination, we have nurses, they're primarily bachelor level nurses, and licensed social workers who screen patients for services and then assess what those patients need. After that assessment is done, um, we identify those strengths as well as the identified needs and then provide traditional care coordination services to them, whether it's helping them find transportation, financial assistance, food, support services. Some of our patients, as many of you I'm sure are aware of in your states, have to decide between whether they're going to fill their medications, their prescriptions, or buy food, um, or get medical equipment. So we help with all of those services. And then we also provide education to our recipients on their chronic conditions so that they can feel more confident in managing the care of their condition. The goals are to achieve medical compliance, attend appointments, and become knowledgeable of their condition. A second component for our health homes are our transitional care services. As many hospitals have, well all hospitals have across the country, they have the discharge planners who help recipients before they go home, but this takes it one step further. Our staff in our health homes actually go into the hospitals and work as a part of the multidisciplinary team helping that patient be discharged. They again identify the needs, they do an assessment to see what that patient's going to need when they come home. We started out with just traditional care nurses when we began back in 2011, but we found that it really did take a multidisciplinary team to help with the transitional care. So we've now encompassed licensed social workers as part of that team and pharmacists. Pharmacists actually make rounds at the hospital with our other health home staff in assisting patients to transition from that healthcare setting back into the home. Where we take it another step further from the discharge planners is once that patient goes home, the nurses, social workers, and perhaps pharmacists go into the home to make sure that patient has what they need, that they've received the medications, that those medications do not have an adverse effect on the medications they had before, and that they're going to that appointment. Oftentimes, our health home staff actually accompany that recipient to their appointment so that they can determine whether the recipient understands what the physician is asking them to do. So they're there side by side with them throughout the hospital setting, going home, and then going to those medical appointments. As part of that transitional care, we also have medication reconciliation. We look at what they're taking. We look at what they're prescribed in the hospital. We have found in Alabama that many times the hospitals will prescribe medications that Medicaid does not cover. They don't cover that particular brand. Our pharmacists can look at that and talk with the doctor or the hospitalist and suggest another brand that Medicaid will cover for that patient. And then again, providing those education and support services in managing chronic conditions. We've talked about the pharmacist. Um, the pharmacist can not only be in the hospital, but can also make those home visits as needed to provide education to that patient. And then the health homes can go a little bit further. Um, they, are, they receive a capitated payment for all the recipients that they see. So they can also provide services that Medicaid does not traditionally offer to our recipients. In one of our health homes, they have used dietitians significantly to provide education. They've even done some um, workshops, one-on-one uh, -on -one work with the recipients, and even a camp for children who have been struggling with obesity to help them learn healthy lifestyles. So what are the benefits to the patients in this program? Well, we've talked about assisting the transition from the hospital back into the home. Um, assessments are done by the nurse and the social workers 
to help determine what those barriers are to healthy living and then helping them to manage those chronic conditions. The pharmacist and the accessibility to that pharmacist is, of course, helpful, as well as those referrals to the community. And then linkage to medical or behavioral health services. That's another key component of the health homes, and we strive to do that. We have found that oftentimes it's a challenge for the primary medical provider and the behavioral health community mental health centers to work together, to communicate together, and we often can be the linkage to that to make sure that the physician understands what the mental health center is doing and vice versa. We found, too, in one of our piloted areas that our recipients who had a behavioral health diagnosis was going faithfully to see their psychiatrist, their counselor, but was not make, they were not making those medical appointments. So we worked diligently to do that to make sure that they were keeping their appointments and going to that as well as their mental health appointments. And then education on those chronic disease and behavioral health conditions are certainly a benefit to our patients in this program. This is also a huge benefit to our providers in helping to manage care of our recipients. Our health home care coordinators are embedded in several different ways. Um, they are housed in our physician's offices as well as public health departments and community mental health. So our physicians have easy access to the care coordinators. When someone comes in to their practice, they can immediately send them to a care coordinator in the health homes who can then assess them there, make home visits, do whatever they need to do for that person. We talked about the communication between the medical physician and the behavioral health and how important that is in linking those, and that's certainly a benefit to the provider. Another part of our health home is bringing providers together to see what initiatives need to happen in their communities. They are required to attend a quarterly medical management meeting to look at the data. All our data right now is it comes through our claims processing in Alabama Medicaid. And they look at that to see, are they behind on EPSDTs? What's going on with asthma? Why are people going into the emergency room? What is going on in that community? And as is common with all other states, what's going on in Birmingham is certainly different than what may be going on in Opelika, Alabama. So those physicians can come together, look at the issues, identify what they are in their own communities, and then set initiatives for improving whatever that barrier is, whether it is flu shots or um, access to care or misuse of the emergency rooms. So it helps them in networking and resolving those issues. And there's shared learning and technical assistance. Um, they can see what's happening in other practices. One of our medical directors in our health home says that since he's been part of the medical home, he handles things in his practice in a completely different way than he did before. And this has helped him learn how to best treat his patients. It's also given the physicians and their practices more time to focus on the recipients in their medical treatment because the care coordinators can then help free up that staff and give them the resources that they need. The health home programs do not work in a silo. They certainly work with other agencies in our community. They are embedded in the community mental health centers as well as in physicians' offices so that they can see the patients where they come for care. We have been closely tied to the Department of Public Health. We work with them as people come into the health department and have partnered with them also with care coordination. Prior to the health homes, Department of Public Health did a lot of care coordination with our patients and continue to do so in conjunction with the health homes. We make sure that those recipients who need services, such as through children's rehab, um, services and other places that chronic conditions may need to be taken care of, make those referrals and work closely with them. 
In addition, we have community food banks we work with. One of our health homes actually set up their own food bank because that was a need in their rural setting. And then family resource centers, which are a one-stop shop in Alabama. So we partner with all of these communities, and they are part of our team in helping our recipients in our health home program. Over the past two years, we have seen tremendous success in our health home program, which is why we've gone statewide. And through that success, we have seen that patient health has improved significantly because of the coordination of care between our health home staff and those community agencies, medical facilities, and our primary care physicians. We have seen a reduction in readmissions to hospitals and emergency room use. A lot of that is through our asthma care and making sure that people have access to care in their communities, including the rural areas. We have multiple stories about patients who have increased ability in managing their chronic conditions due to patient education, access to needed resources, and support from nurses, social workers, and pharmacists. And then the ability to use non-traditional resources has been a great way for our health homes to meet the needs of our recipients. None of our health homes look alike. They are not cookie cutter programs. Um, they have been able to assess what is needed in their areas of the state and develop resources for those recipients. I had mentioned earlier the use of dietitians, healthy living camps. We found that in a couple of our regions that patients who were coming out of psychiatric facilities could not get into a psychiatrist in a timely manner. Instead of being followed up in two weeks, it might be two or three months. So that health home was able to contract with a psychiatrist to get them in for those appointments until they could get in with the psychiatrist that they would be seeing after they were discharged. This clearly was a way to avoid rehospitalization into our psychiatric facilities. So we have seen tremendous success with our health home program. We were excited about going statewide with this program. Um, Alabama is now going toward a managed care model. It's called regional care organizations. And this is the primary stepping stone to that, uh, which will be implemented in 2016. That is the end of my presentation, and now I will turn it on over to the next speaker. Thank you for that. Oh, sorry, I'm Lisa, one moment. Thank you for that presentation, Carolyn. I just wanted to remind all the participants that the Q&A button is actually on the bottom left of your screen, and you can ask questions at any point during the presentation. Go ahead, Lisa. Thank you, Samantha. Hi. My name is Lisa Leidendorf, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and the executive director of the Northeast Oregon Network. And um, just real briefly, the Northeast Oregon Network, um, our, our overall goal is to improve the health outcomes for all residents in our service area. And our mission is to increase access to and quality of integrated health and social services for all of our residents. And we do that by identifying system gaps, facilitating community developed solutions with our partners, and advocating for health policy change. So we really look at um, how can we, at a local level that's close to all the providers and organizations working directly with community members, provide technical assistance and resource development and system develop system development to help raise our overall level and capacity. So today um, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to be talking with you about a specific care coordination practice that's going to get into a little into the weeds a little bit more about um, what actually happens in the care coordination practice. And this practice um, is an evidence-based practice through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, called the Pathways Community Hub. So, 
So the overall goal of this uh, particular evidence-based practice is to improve the health of the entire community while reducing utilization of high-cost care. Our implementation is currently focusing on cardiac and diabetic conditions. Like most rural areas nationwide, our population is aging and is poor, systemically and long-term. Um, when we look at some of our health outcome indicators, we have cardiac and diabetic health indicators that are in excess of state and national averages. So our prevalence rates are in excess of state and national averages, and our age-adjusted death rates are in excess of state and national averages, and that's what we term a health disparity, when you notice that there are excess mortality and prevalence rates uh, compared to other regions. So you can kind of see there our uh, blood pressure and cholesterol rates are running at 36 and 47 percent, whereas the Oregon average is uh, 26 and 30 percent. So our current funding, we're really a grassroots organization that works to devise new practices that are designed to fit local communities. Most of the time, we end up implementing these through grant funding. And a part of our role in the project is seeking ongoing sustainability if the project is successful. So background uh, setup funding for this project was um, provided by the Centers for Disease Control Small Community Transformation Grant. We're currently funded by a Health Resources and Services Administration Network Development Grant. And some local foundation uh, has also provided funding. So as the hub is established and expands, um, we do intend to serve broader populations. The nice thing to keep in mind about this model is that it's able to be expanded to any population where you might have a health disparity uh, across the age range um, involving really any particular conditions or issues. So the heart of this model is what's called a pathway, which is basically a very simple, logical tool that allows care coordination to be provided in a standardized manner and mechanism. So the first step is to find the individuals at risk. Um, and this might sound particularly easy, but it's actually uh, rather difficult. Most of the folks that um, are in need of care coordination that are high utilization, high cost, are not necessarily successfully engaged uh, with, with health homes or with necessary uh, services to help them manage. So I first, first step is identifying the individuals, in this case, with diabetic or cardiac conditions, or that have risk factors for such, such as obesity or smoking status, who also have high social service and care coordination needs. Really treating, and treating here is essentially the provision of linkage services, not medical services. So the community health worker meets and follows um, an action plan, creates an action plan with the community member, and that action plan is what is a pathway, follows the steps of the pathways to completion. The role of the hub is really to measure outcomes by reviewing the completed pathways and clinical and cost indicators. A key piece of this evidence-based practice is that we uh, not only provide the services, but measure the outcomes so that we can be sure we're meeting the targets and goals. So if you look today at what a lot of care coordination looks like today in many places, this is a picture of our, our capital in Salem. Um, you see funding coming through, and many of these names you'll be familiar with, TANF, which is a federal program, SNAP, the food stamp program, SSDI, income supplements for, um, for elderly and disabled, Ross is a housing program, Medicaid funding, Head Start early education funding, and the funding all comes down through these separate silos that are not necessarily connected or coordinating. It's very fragmented. The goal of the hub in each community is to essentially create a much more organized method. So um, you basically have a hub um, in, in the center, which in this case is, is managed by NEON. Um, the goal of that hub is to, uh, or the, the roles of the hub are to 
trained staff, in this case community health workers, um, provide data collection systems, uh, measure outcomes across the system, provide referral and enrollment uh, to care coordination agencies, and to obtain and secure braided funding from multiple services. You have care coordination agencies who are contracted to employ the staff who provide the care coordination, and then you have payers. This can be grants, foundations, insurance companies, um, uh, various divisions of state government. And then we have partner organizations. Um, these might be the social service agency that is working with someone on, um, an example might be working with someone on low-income housing. They're also a diabetic who isn't taking insulin. So they would identify and reflect in. We have community health workers that are working in these multiple organizations within the community so they can be accessed in multiple spots. And then um, how it works is we essentially have a, a, com a community member that's identified um, either by a payer or a state system or by one of these local community partners. They're identified as meeting the criteria and are enrolled in the hub. The community member is then linked with a community health worker of their choice in one of the community-based organizations, and we begin providing services. So these particular pathways are tools that are designed um, with this goal in mind, to really shift to measurable outcomes. Um, they, the idea is to target those that would benefit the most from specific interventions. And one of the unique pieces about this is that payments are linked to outcomes, not to services. So the contracted organization gets paid when their community health worker successfully completes a pathway, not every time they have a visit, which is um, an alternative payment methodology, which I'm sure some of you have um, heard about when considering healthcare reform. A real specific practical example here is a medication assessment pathway. And this is where a community health worker goes into the home, says to the identified community member, so let's take a look at your medications. Bring them all out, put them on the table, and tell me how you seek them. And there's a form that, as the community member tells the community health worker how they take the medication, they write down in that person's language how they take it. So they might say, I take the pink one at lunch, and I don't know what I take it for. And um, I do the injection after I do my blood sugar, that's for diabetes. So you would write it down in their language. Community health worker then sends this medication assessment chart back to the provider, and the provider takes a look at it and, and either goes, holy smokes, that's not how they're supposed to be taking their medication, or they look at it and they say, yeah, that looks right. If they say, yeah, that looks right, then great, we know the patient is squared away with taking their medication. If it looks, if the provider goes, you know, holy smokes, that's not correct, then the community health worker gets them back into the provider for medication assessment. Um, and we repeat this process until the provider says it's correct. The reason this particular pathway is so important is that when you look at most readmissions for hospitalization with 30 days, medications either not accessed appropriately and or not taken appropriately are one of the main reasons for readmission. The pathways that we use are health insurance coverage, making sure people have coverage. Medical home, you've heard our other two presenters talk about that, making sure people are connected to a medical home. Medical referral pathway for if they need medical services. A social service referral pathway for if they need social services, such as food, housing, education, transportation, child care assistance. Medication assessment and management pathways and tobacco association pathways. This model is fueled by community health workers, trained community health workers. Oregon just recently created a certification for that in the last two years. NEON has a community health worker training. We've trained over 80 in the last um, 18 months. And um, that's really what fuels uh, this is staffing that fuels this particular model. If we look at the successes we've had to date, this is really a grassroots effort. So it's a little bit different in that while there are, there are lots of state-initiated reforms happening in Oregon, um, we've worked on the end of grassroots solutions that can kind of 
grow up locally and, and meet in the middle with a lot of the state identified reforms. And that really comes out of our belief that healthcare is essentially local and health improvement happens locally. Um, it's aligned with the goals, outcome, and metrics of healthcare transformation in Oregon. So be very careful as we develop this project to keep them in alignment with that. We significantly retooled re the current healthcare and social service workforce in the area. And um, this is very community connected, so it involves community leadership teams to not only advise, but also um, have operational decision making roles. The collaborations involved are primary care clinics. Uh, patient center primary care homes, parenting and prevention agencies, local public health departments, mental health and addiction treatment organizations, local area agencies um, on aging and local anti-poverty action agencies, State Department of Human Services and Aging, and uh, partnerships with hospitals. We also have developmental partnerships with Medicaid payer and other payers. So um, we also have yeah, so finally, our challenges and barriers. Um, so the greatest strength in this is our greatest weakness. Being grassroots and local means that there are struggles in elevating the visibility and importance of this work uh, to payers. That's a process that we're engaged in, but anyone else implementing this model would need to be aware of the significant amount of work it takes to connect with, um, with broader system um, reforms and payment mechanisms. It does take a while to develop the partnerships and momentum. One of the reasons this um, is so effective is that it really involves the entire community, but it also can take quite a while to get the entire community um, coordinated and in agreement. Negotiating data system and hub procedures that all can agree to and be accountable also takes a while. Um, it, when you're paying folks for outcome, you have to have some pretty clear ideas and triggers about what the outcome is that you're looking for and when that payment point is met. And that's risky for people. It's a somewhat scary thing to be paid strictly and only for the outcome you produce. Um, introducing community into medical systems really can highlight areas of incongruence in language systems and values between how the community views health and how medical systems views health. That provides opportunity for improvement, but it can also provide some challenges. So um, that's a brief overview of our particular practice. And um, I'm going to turn it back to the moderator now for questions, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'd like to thank our three speakers for their excellent presentations. And the floor is now open for participants' question and answer session. Just as a quick reminder, you can ask a question by clicking at, on the button in the bottom left of the screen. And remember to please ask all your questions to all panelists, and questions will remain anonymous. So our first question today is for Lisa. Lisa, the question is, does Medicaid reimburse for the coordination services if the client is Medicaid eligible? Um, so the, that's been, this is something that's been under development in the state of, of Oregon. Um, and a lot of this works state to state. So in our particular practice, our local coordinated care organization that manages Medicaid payment has just recently added a small um, payment for volume aspect to this. So they are providing, um, they're paying for up to eight 30 minute sessions a month. And they just recently started that. They're not yet paying for the volume piece, that's still, or the, the outcome piece. That's still experimental. And that's what we are providing and paying for at the moment. Um, this will vary from state to state. The Centers for Medicaid Services does have provisions that allow um, that allow Medicaid payers to reimburse for community health care services. Not all states are doing that or have done that yet. Other states that have implemented this best practice, such as Ohio, yes, the Medicaid managed care companies are paying um, full out for the outcome model. So we're in developmental phases and are kind of halfway there at this point. Thank you, Lisa. Our next question is for Jennifer. Jennifer, what state support or funding does your program receive? 
Thanks, that's a great question. So um, for our eye care program, uh, we began the program um, through our federal um, flex funds, the Medicare Rural Hospital Flexibility Grant that we get through um, HRSA. Um, and then we were able to also leverage some funds from our um, Department of Public Health and Environment to expand the program out to um, our rural health clinics and incorporate more of the diabetes focus for them as well. Thank you, Jennifer. And this question is for Carolyn. Carolyn, how has your health home program impacted access to behavioral health providers that are in short supply in rural areas? One way we have done that is through our emergency psychiatric appointments. That continues to be an issue for us, um, but we embed our care coordinators in the mental health centers to make sure they're getting into those appointments. We also have a telehealth program through public health that also assists us with that, um, but that's a resource available to the health homes and all of our Medicaid recipients. Thank you, Carolyn. And as a follow-up for you, again, has Medicaid realized cost savings from the program, and do you collect and report this data? Yes, that's part of the requirements of health homes is that we report that data um, on the measures that they put out for us. And we have seen a cost savings with this program, um, even though we, we have some money tied into it, we have seen that overall cost comparing it to our patient, our other Medicaid recipients, that we do save money. Thank you, Carolyn. And I have a question that is for all presenters. How, if at all, is your state incorporating telemedicine into care coordination? This is Lisa. Um, the state of Oregon actually, in its, its legislative session that just ended, just passed a bill um, allowing for and requiring and mandating widespread use, uh, widespread reimbursement of telemedicine, which has really opened the door um, within Oregon to expand and support the use of that. Most of our providers, um, we're in a frontier area, very geographically isolated, utilize some form of telemedicine. One of the biggest barriers has been getting reimbursement for that, but the state has just really um, allowed an openness for that that will, I'm sure, increase the use of telemedicine. This is Carolyn. We have partnered with Alabama Department of Public Health with our biomonitoring program through their home health program. Those with particular chronic conditions, we do have telemedicine with them. Um, they call into an automated system, put in their statistics, their uh, is weight, blood sugar, and high blood sugar. And from that, it goes to a web-based program, and we have nurses that monitor that through Alabama Department of Public Health. And that, and that is part of our health home program. And this is Jen, and I think um, similar to what some of the other presenters have said, there are um, a lot of facilities that are using or interested in exploring um, telehealth and with some of the focus that the state has on integrating um, behavioral and primary um, care as well. I think that that will be um, more of an emerging issue even moving forward. Thank you, Jennifer. I have another question for you. Could you tell us more about the exercise program in the schools and rural areas, as in who conducts the exercise classes and how is it funded? That's a great question, um, and that was in one of the communities that we're working with, and I don't have additional details for that, but if somebody's interested, they're welcome to contact me, and I can find out for them. Thank you. Lisa, I have another question for you. How do you identify the recipients, and are they referred to your program? So the recipients um, can be identified from multiple different points in the community. And part of the idea is that we engage the entire community in, in identifying them. So sometimes they are identified by a community organization. So it might be um, the primary care partner identifies them as fitting program criteria. It might be the 
local domestic violence shelter has someone comes in and identifies them as that, and any, really anyone in the community. And that's when you saw the list of collaborations. That's one of the things those list of collaborations do is they're aware of the program and the criteria and identification. They can also be identified by um, payers and or departments of state government. So we have referral contract agreements with our State Department of Aging and People and Disabilities, with Pacific Source, um, and with our Medicaid payer. So that if they're identifying someone on there and is a payer as a high utilizer, they refer them into the hub, and then we refer them out locally. So it can come either from a higher level of, of um, essentially payer monitoring, or it can come from a community level. We also promote via Facebook and outreach so that people can self-identify and refer in as well. Thank you. And now that concludes our question and answer period. If you have any questions after the webinar, please feel free to contact me at the following email address. And remember, this webinar will be archived and available at the following link. And additional resources regarding the topics discussed today can be accessed at the following links. Again, I'd like to thank today's speakers and all of the attendees for your time and participation in today's conference. And thank you to the Health Resources and Services Administration for their support of this webinar. That concludes today's webinar.